Um, uh, good to see everyone. Uh, happy to be back and excited for the uh, the draft next week. Um, certainly want to thank my personnel staff and the coaching staff for all their hard work. Um, certainly all year round, but um, especially these last few few months and weeks, we've been um, putting our final touches on the draft board and look forward to Thursday and, and hopefully adding some more talent to the roster. So with that, open it up and take some questions. Let's go ahead and start with Pete. Go ahead, Pete. Hey, Brett, uh, curious hey. about uh, this draft in, in particular when it comes to um, offensive tackle, wide receiver, just casting a wide net, what you think of those two positions, and then where you think maybe the, the best value uh, in this uh, class would be? Yeah, I think um, I think the draft in general has some um, positional depth, um, although it is funny when we're looking at the numbers and the general consensus is, uh, this is a, a deep O line class, or this is a, um, you know, a deep D line class, or what have you. It it it's not necessarily true for for us. I think sometimes because like for the tackle position, I think once you get past like pick thirty five or forty, most of those guys are gone. So if you're picking in the top ten, it's a great offensive line class. If you're picking in the top fifteen, it's a great offensive line class. Um, if you're picking thirty two and sixty four, um, you got a shot maybe here or there. So. Um, I think that goes into, you know, the additional work we put in and, and putting a strategy together and what guys uh, might be worth a move, um, depending on how it all plays out and, um, you know, what other positions are going to provide uh, top end value if, if say, an O-lineman or receiver isn't there. And, um, you know, do you go corner? Do you go defensive line? I think that there are some interesting pockets there. Um, so. I think the good thing is, uh, that, like every year, there's a lot of good players, and it's just a matter of um, working on our our board, our system, um, given the picks we have, and and the you know the potential moves we can make. We'll go next to Matt Derrick. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, Brett. Um, you, we haven't really got a chance to talk to you since the free agency period started. Mm -hmm. So that was that was one of my two questions. The, but that one. Um, what was kind of your take on just everything that you were able to get done, especially, you know, Chris and bringing so many of the guys back on defense and, and obviously the addition of Hollywood Brown too. And then I'll have a follow-up. Yeah. So going into the off season, uh, a lot of work to do and, uh, always unique challenges depending on the year and, uh, you know, what your, your cap situation looks like, uh, when we left, uh, Vegas and had a chance to, to get together, uh, before the combine, we were just kind of outlining some different ideas and some thought processes. And one of the things that I think was glaring to us was you know, we were potentially looking at losing most, if not all of our defensive line, uh, Mike Dana, Chris Jones, uh, Turk Wharton, Derek Noddy. So um, obviously a huge amount of concern there, uh, especially uh, given how well our defense played last year. I mean, it was one of the top units in the NFL. Those guys have all played together in the system for a long time. So um, Chris right out of the gate was our priority. I uh, wanted to make sure we got him done. And then I think there was a little domino effect there. Um, had to move with LJ and um, we were able to um, to bring Mike Dana back. But I think being able to secure that that front with Dana, uh, Turk, Nadi, and Jones was really important to us. Bringing back Drew uh, Tranquil was important to us. So really focused on, um, you know, retaining as much of that defense from last year as we could. Um, and then uh, like every year, whether it be for agency in the draft, the, if there's an opportunity to, to add a playmaker uh, for Pat, we're always going to be looking for those options and played um, played it out, so to speak, you know, in some other positions. And um, I think we were lucky that, you know, Hollywood situation played out the way he did and think he's going to be a great one year addition for us. And he's going to set himself up nicely moving forward. So um, I think we're excited. And, you know, it's like I said, every year is different and unique. And I think with the resources we had available, we we maximized what, what, what we can do this offseason. You mentioned like the offensive line in particular and the depth in this draft. Um, you know, you've made you this organization's made a move before from 27 to 10 to get a quarterback. Um, could you ever envision yourself going to 32 to top 15, top 10 um for a non-quarterback position? I mean, I, I, I can envision myself. I mean, um, gotta get the owner's approval on that. But uh um no, I think it just it's it it changes every year. And I think um we have a pretty good plan this you know, this upcoming week. Um, but yeah, I think, listen, every situation is unique. I mean, we, we've had conversations in the last few years um, about guys that we consider top five, top six prospects, if they were to fall into the teens moving up. And um, uh, 
got Clark and Andy involved and they were all in it and those situations just didn't work out. So I think that I certainly could see something like that. Um, a lot of things have to fall in place though for that to happen. So it'd have to be the probably a specific guy or two and then probably getting into um, a landing spot that's not expected. And then if he does get to that landing spot that's not expected, the team is willing to work with you on a trade that makes sense. So uh, certainly can see it. A lot of things have to happen and, and fall in place for uh, for that to, um, you know, to, you know, to, to see an outcome like that. But I, I always think anything's possible. We'll go next to Sam McDowell. Hey, Brett. A um, couple of things hey, for you. Um, just wondering, uh, without asking you to reveal your draft board, just what you think overall of the wide receiver class. I think it's it's one of the deeper cl classes. Um, I think the good thing about the wide receiver position, this is typically every year, is they provide depth really one through five, and there's always um, – you know, pockets of players. I think there's a large group of, of receivers in the first 50 picks. I think that we have great grades on. And then I think there's another pocket right right behind that. I think um, that is a positive. I think, you know, corner, there's some some depth, you know, middle to later on in the draft. Um, o lineman, as I mentioned in the opener, it's, it's really good early. Um, and so there'll be a late run on those guys, but um, it, it tails off a little bit. I think it's a better defensive line class than we've seen in, in the past. I think there's some good mid-round depth there. Um, you know, linebacker running, running back's probably um, a little lighter uh, than years past. So I, I think O-line receivers, corners are, are good hot spots throughout the draft. And that's a good thing because we can use one of each of those. And then... Um... You know, just just based on how last year unfolded, particularly the back end of the draft, you know, I, I know there were a, at least a, a couple teams that weren't excited to deal with you. What, what's this last week like as far as setting up the potential if there are guys that maybe you would want to trade up for as the draft unfolds? Well, we'll see. Uh, typically, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right before the draft is when the teams uh, do all their call checks, make sure the phone numbers are working for the teams. Um you know, so we'll we'll get an email list of draft day phone numbers. So we typically do a run through and check with all the teams. And and once we do that, it, it usually kind of spins into just some um, casual dialogue, hypothetically. And, and you know, if you were looking to move up or move back, those type of scenarios. So I think we'll do a good job again out in front of this and, and talking to some teams and, um, you know, seeing where their mind is in regards to value of of or their boards or what they're you know what boards they're working on a large a large part of this is just making sure we're all on the same page in regards to what draft boards you're working from because as you know sam there's teams there's tons of boards each team has their own boards and in a combination of other teams boards with historical boards they use so we typically uh, reach out to those teams early in the week um make sure the phones are working and uh exchange some ideas and, <clears throat> and usually just make sure we're all on the same page in regards to what boards we're working off of And we'll go next to Sarin Petro. I don't, and I'll have a follow-up, uh, Sydney, if I could. Uh, Brett, uh, in, in light of what's going on with Rashi Rice, does that uh, make you have to, you know, put some guys like a Tavondre Sweat, who got a DWI uh, in the last week or so, do you have to push those guys off your board more now because of what you're dealing with currently? Yeah, I think, I mean, we we spend a great deal of time on all these players and you know, I, I think we have to look at um, each individual case um, independently and, and just work through it. And, um, you know, I think maybe subconsciously, maybe it, it it factors a little, but I think that when we stick to our process and, um, you know, trust the guys that we have around us, I mean, we have a great coaching staff, we have a great personnel staff, we have, um, you know, uh, great security team. So um, we really re lean on those guys. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I trust the people around me and, um, you know, they spend a lot of time working on on the player and his ability to come in here and, and, and be a big, good person, um, be a good teammate. And so I think, we, you know, we try to, to stick to, you know, what we've done in the past. And I mean, there'll always be some things that, that factor into ultimately what we decide to do with a guy. Um, but I think sticking to our process and we've done this now for, you know, a little bit here and it over the long run, it's, it's, you know, provided us um, a good blueprint to work off of. And then kind of a 
follow up to what Sam had. Since you won the championship, do you find yourself like there aren't as many trade partners? Teams actively don't want to deal with you because they're afraid that they'll be helping the champ. Um, I, I think um, yes and no. I, I think that if a team um, if it can benefit them, I, I think they're always going to pick up the phone and call and be willing to work. I don't think a team is going to, um, you know, diminish their ability to do something they really want to do just because it's the Chiefs. Um, I do think, though, that um, the ability to deal with certain teams, uh, I mean, it's always been understood that if you're going to deal with a team in your division, there's a little bit more of a premium. But I think um, just some of the AFC teams in general um, that are consistent playoff performers. I mean, the Buffaloes and the Cincinnati's and uh, the Baltimore's. I mean, it's probably a little bit harder to deal with those teams. And even if they do pick up the phone, I think some of their asking prices are a tick higher. Um, so I, I think we get hit with a little bit more interest. But I, I think that there's always a way to make a deal. But I, I think certain, yeah, certain teams will will probably up the price up a little bit. We'll go ahead and wrap up with the last five hands that are up. So Blair, you're next. Hey, Brett, uh, I think you just touched on this a second ago, and I think we ask you this every year, but uh, uh, the value of the visit, you know, whether it's at the combine or, or a pro day or whatever, what, what kind of information do you glean from that and how helpful can it be? Oh, it's extremely helpful. And and I mean, when the guys come in here for the visit, I mean, they're here all, all day. I mean, they'll start um, in the training room. Um, they'll go through another comprehensive MRI and um meeting with Rick. And then from there, I mean, they get a chance to visit with all of our coaches. And at the combine, we do have a chance to spend some time with these kids. But I mean, it's maxed out at like 15 to 17 minutes. So you get a chance to get a brief intro, um, a little bit of an idea of their background. And you get into some football, but it, it's not very long. So I think just having the whole day and getting to know the person, understand the, the person more, talk through things, talk through football, talk through, uh, through their upbringing. Um, all that kind of stuff is extremely important to us. And, you know, typically it, you, we go through our system and, and guys, we either feel, you know, one way or the other. And, and guys that, you know, we're not interested in is one category. And then guys that we feel really good about, we know this guy, um, it, it, it's not going to do us any good. Um, you know, we don't deal with those guys. But then you have a handful of guys that you just, you don't, when you're at the combine, you felt like that 15 minutes just wasn't enough and you wanted some more information. And then there's another series of guys you bring in that didn't get invited to the combine. So you kind of like them to some degree, but you have no medical on them whatsoever. So those guys have to come in because there's just no medical on them. So it's a it's a combination of um, different combinations of reasons of why we bring guys in, but they're super beneficial for us. Let's go next to Jesse. Hey, Sid, I'll have a follow-up too. Hey, Brett, I just wanted, with Rashid's kind of unknown status right now, how, if at all, does that change or affect your guys' draft and who you might take? Yeah, I don't I don't know if it does, just because I think we have a lot of needs. And I think it's one of those things that, you know, you go into every draft. I mean, I, I mean, you can look at our roster, and I think short of quarterback, um, you know, maybe linebacker. Um, but I think that there's needs on the offensive line for sure. I mean, um, you know, guard center depth, competition at left tackle, um, receiver, there's a need. Cornerback, we just lost need. We do have some good young guys. We do have Nazi Johnson coming back. Um, but corners are hard to find. Um, you know, we could probably throw safety in there too, because I think we really like Shamari Connor and, and Cook and, and Reed. So um, I mean, look, I I think that it's it's one of those scenarios where I, I think there's a lot of positions that would make sense for us. And and, and again, we start at the O-line, D-line, and receiver position, but um, it's a long season and, you know, death is super important to us. And also, you know, guys, contracts do run out. And, you know, I think anytime you get a player that you think can come in here and challenge for a starting position right away, I think you go in that direction. Yeah, you kind of let me do this one. You know, situations change every year. A couple of years ago, you guys had lots of draft capital, um, you know, go up and get Trent McDuffie. How likely do you think a trade up is this year, just given your overall depth and the draft capital that you have? Yeah, it's just kind of you, you know weighing the options and on one end there's probably you know i think there's 16 18 guys this year that we have as first round grades um you factor in some quarterbacks there so you know and then some maybe uh, some teams that go in different directions that are contradictory to what our board has so you figure 16 to 18 names 
four quarterbacks, uh, maybe five quarterbacks. I mean, there could be a window there where we have an opportunity to get a guy and then just weighing, you know, the cost because um, if it is a, a corner or an old lineman uh, or, you know, receiver, you know, we're, we're probably going to give up the opportunity to draft um, that other position later in, in the draft. So um, is, you know, one guy that you have a first round grade on better than two guys that you maybe have second, third round grades on. It's just kind of weighing that formula for us. And, you know, I think that's where it comes down to just, you know, the value of that guy that that falls. And if he's one of those guys that you really have as a top 10, top 12 pick, I think you up and do it like Trent McDuffie's situation. I think if it's one of those guys, I think we'll, we'll certainly be aggressive and hopefully we can find a trading partner. But I also think there's some depth in, in round two there. So, um, you know, I do think there's opportunities to um, add players that come in and push for starting positions in rounds two and three as well. Let's go next to Nick Jacobs. And Sydney, I'll have a quick follow-up. Um, Brett, for you, rough estimate wise, do you know how many guys you have on your board? Um, I wrote that down. I knew someone was going to ask me that because yeah. I never know. I just see a bunch of names up there. Right. Um, I don't like count them. I sort of just move them around <laughs> and I have them in, in like pockets and, um, but I was walking in here. I said, someone's going to ask me exactly how many guys I have on the board. So it's 221, um, which is a lot. But I, you'd have to come in here and be with me one day to see how I process this. Because, like, I have guys in the sixth or seventh round on my board. But I always know that we'll never get to the sixth and seventh round. So the, the total number of boards, uh, total number of players on the board, 221. Um, but in my mind, there's kind of like a line right there. And those guys in six and seven we keep on the board because that's where I want to work down on free agency. And so I know where I'm going. Um, as soon as the draft's over, the guys that we had on the board at six and seven, again, we'll have plenty of numbers. We'll never get to them, but that's my free agency board. And that's kind of how we work through that. And then my last question for you, each draft is unique, has a unique characteristic to it. Like 83, having the five quarterbacks in the first round. I know a couple of years ago, you thought there'd be a thousand yard rusher in the seventh round. For this draft class, what do you think is gonna it's gonna be remembered for down the road? Um, well, gosh, that's that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what it will be remembered for. I think it, you know, obviously it'll depend on how these um where these players go and and, and how successful they are and, and what teams um strategize to do different things. One interesting perspective that I did find kind of going through this is just the nil effect so you know typically when you're working through the fourth fifth sixth round um there's always interesting prospects and um small school guys and um but i think it's what you're starting to see is these fourth fifth sixth round prospects are, are a little older because they're staying and some of these underclassmen that get third fourth round grades they have the opportunity to stay in, in school. And so I don't know if these drafts and this will be a trend where they won't be as deep as they used to be. So, I mean, if you're a junior and you have a third or fourth round grade and you have an opportunity to stay in school and make money, you're going to go back, potentially stay in school. And so what happens is, is I, I think the drop off from rounds three, the cutoff line, I, I think the availability of, young guys with potential that came out early maybe they shouldn't they would have stayed they would have been a first or second round pick well, those guys are staying now um so i think the drop-off numbers are a little bit more extreme this year and the players are a little bit older so we have to work a little bit harder to find some young guys with upside that we really like that to me i found i found challenging and when we were going through the board it was one of the things that i kind of like just instinctively thought and then when i checked with our guys they were like yeah these guys are a lot older and um but again you know when you have a ton of underclassmen that put their name in decide to come out that makes every draft deeper when guys are staying in it's going to make every draft um a little tougher to work with uh, on the back end let's go to adam tasher hey good morning brett hey adam how you doing Good, good. Hey, Dorsey would be appalled at you for having 221 names on your board. Yes, yeah, uh, too many. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I don't, I we, couple... don't, we don't use them all. We just have them up there just for uh, <laughs> for a free agency. Uh, all right. Um, 
you uh, I just wanted to um, get your expectations on a couple of guys f- for this upcoming season, uh, Sky Moore and Kadarius Tony. What, what are your expectations for those guys for this year? And uh, Sid, I'll have a second question as well. Yeah, I mean, look, we obviously hoping um, both continue to to improve, progress, and and are able to be consistent playmakers for us. And you know, I know Kadarius has obviously had a long history of of injury issues, but um, I mean, he is probably our most talented wideout. Um, now again, it, it doesn't do anyone any good unless, unless you stay healthy, but I mean, the kid has always worked hard here for us. And, you know, I know he's been down there with Pat and I think it's just a matter of, um, of him staying healthy. And and I think if he can do that, um, he can really do a lot of great things in this offense. And, you know, that's one of the things that there was a lot of speculation about KT, but I I don't think that, you know, we ever stopped believing in him. And I think um, people around the building like him and, and you know, it, it's, it's the injury bug and hopefully he gets some luck on his side and he can stay healthy and, and be the player that he was in Florida and, and the player that we've seen in spurts here. So um, just hoping he has a good off season and, and has a little luck on his side and can stay healthy. And, and what Sky, Sky's always been, you know, mentally tough kid and, you know, he's still, uh, he, you know, he had that knee injury last year too. So, you know, to some degree, just these guys being on the field, staying healthy, and then, you know, making plays when their number's called. And um, the great thing about both these guys are the two guys are really like as, as people and they're smart guys and, and they work hard. Now it's just a matter of um, them putting themselves in position to, um, um, to earn consistent playing time and then make plays when their number's called. Okay. And, um, a similar question on Wanya Morris, just what you thought of him um, when he had to go in and play last year for those four or five games. And um, what, 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 what is his readiness maybe to be a, a, an every down starting left tackle, if that's what you need him to be this year? Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I, so I think we were really happy with Wanya's um, development last year. And I think he showed some signs early on in the OTAs that we were really excited about um, continue that growth and maturation process during the training camp um and then middle of the season there he got an opportunity some good some bad i think and i think one one would tell you this i think if you look at his body of work last year i think on one end you're happy that he was able to come in at the pro level and be competitive um it wasn't perfect um but it also was was solid play that i think is a good foundation to build and grow on um but he has to come in here with the mindset that, you know, we're going to look to bring in competition and, you know, he's got to come in here and, and win that position. And I think it's his job to come in and be prepared to win that position. And I think it's our job to go out there and find competition, um, you know, for, for that um, left tackle spot. So, um, you know, I think, again, I think that there's a lot of promise in there and there's a lot of ability. Um, but certainly I think, you know, it's our job to bring in some competition there and make him earn that and work for that. And we'll go last to Nate Taylor. Brett, on the left tackle situation, how much do you prefer, or I guess has the organization, how much do you all prefer um, position flexibility, having a left tackle who could potentially play right tackle if necessary? And um, given it's a premium position, I guess how important is it to sort of find that next guy that can obviously play that position for multiple years, given you had left tackles of different guys over the last couple of years. Yeah, we put a lot of stock in flexibility. Um, as you mentioned, Nate, um, you even saw that last game of the year when we um, played the old line coach had those guys playing different positions that, uh, you know, Creed played guard and, you know, the tackles swap positions and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, that just, it, it kind of illustrates exactly what we think of positional flex and in game situations. You never know if it's going to be a right guard, a left guard, a center, a right or left tackle that goes down. So, yeah. Uh, position flexibility does heavily weigh into it. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that or a lot of O-line coaches would tell you, if you can play tackle, you can potentially play any position across the board. So that, I think that's why tackle is so premium. It, you know, have to pre- protect the quarterback's edge and, and the blind side, but also typically those tackles um, are athletic enough to to slide inside and and sometimes even play play center. We saw that with Mitch Morris a few years ago. He was a tackle in college and he ended up being a really good center. So I'm um, position um flexibility is super important to us and yeah and, and you know it is a quarterback league and and you got to protect them and you got to get after them and, and those tackle positions are always going to be important because they 
protect the most important player in your team. So um, if we get an opportunity to, to get one of those guys for sure, I mean, it, you know, it's it's always on your mind, um, just like DN and DT. So um, again, hopefully the numbers work out and hopefully there's uh, a window of opportunity for us, but I do think there's some some really good players in rounds two and three. So just uh, need a little patience and a little luck, I guess.